Good morning. We're getting started with our second panel of the day, Makerspaces, all these wonderful creative people here today. Uh, Makerspaces and hands-on creativity to design and invent. And our moderator for this session, Ken Montgomery, he's with Design Tech High School and he is the co-founder and executive director of this high school. It's, uh, he's been working a lot with Stanford University's uh, D School to re redesign high school education. So he has a great perspective. Uh, we also have um, Lisa Regala. She's with Bay Area Discovery Museum and she does a lot of uh, stuff with kids, um, especially uh, kids outside um, that come from under-resourced uh, communities. Uh, Smita Kolataka. Thank you. Um, she's from our Palo Alto Unified School District down uh, the peninsula here in the Bay Area. And she works with K through five. Um, she's an ed tech specialist, so she has a lot of hands-on uh, things that she's done with the kids, uh, robotics, coding, 3D uh, printing, one-to-one -one iPads, all sorts of great stuff. And finally, at the end, we have Casey Shea. He's up in uh, Sonoma County in the Bay Area, and he's with the Office of Education and he's done a uh, curriculum coordination around making. So those are our panelists, our moderator, and uh, here you go. All right, thank you. Thank you for coming, everyone. Uh, so the structure of this, we'll just uh, engage with the panel for the first half, about 30 minutes, then we'll open it up to questions from the audience. Um, but before we get started, can I just get a sense of who all is here? Um, could you please raise your hand if you work in a K-12 education? <laughs> okay, I, I understand that. <laughs> sort of, maybe a little bit of both. <laughs> uh, how about um, a post-secondary institution? Okay. Um, how about at, at a policy level? And any nonprofits outside? Okay. So this is oh, there. We go. there. All right, <laughs> nailed it. <laughs> I knew if I kept going, <laughs> you know, we get the solid hand up. So uh, I'd just like to start, um, just to give each of the panelists a chance to introduce themselves. And if you could also, so we get to know you better, in part of your introduction, if you could give us a sense of when you first began to identify as a maker yourself. And what was the experience and really like what helped you begin to assume that identity? So go ahead, we can just go ahead and go down the line, Lisa. Um, hello, my name's Lisa Regala. I'm not Jane Warner but I'm filling in for her today on the panel. I'm with the Bay Area Discovery Museum and our Center for Childhood Creativity. We are located in Sausalito, so not too far from here. Uh, at, at the museum, I kind of wear two hats. So at the museum, I oversee our early childhood fab lab. We have a fab lab that caters towards children ages three to eight. And then I also oversee our brand new mobile program called the Try It Truck, which is a mobile maker space that we take to K-5. <laughs> And then uh, my other hat is with our Center for Childhood Creativity. So that's really an advisory group where we work to transform research into practice through professional development and partnering with um, various companies and nonprofits to help them uh, with early childhood education and creativity. Uh, so when did I know I was a maker? Probably in theater. I was a double major of chemistry in theater in undergrad. And uh, so I was a, you know, had the science brain side of me, but I actually think I found my maker side through theater because I had to take a set design class where I had to learn how to build sets and I had to learn how to weld. And I was terrified of welding and I thought it was just something that wasn't for me. It was never something um, that I was kind of encouraged to experiment with in my life. And I was so empowered after I learned how to weld and I thought I could make anything. And I think that's when I first, first kind of started to identify that way. Thank you. I am Smita Kulhatkar, and um, I work at Barron Park Elementary in the Palo Alto Unified School District. Uh, work with students K through five and teachers pre-K through 12. The, um, it's been a wonderful journey with the Makerspace because we basically had um, you know, a noontime coding club going from five years ago, and then um, we also got a 3D printer through a grant, why not have a space where every kid can have access to it? We're a unique school in Palo Alto in that um, 
we have a 30% socioeconomically, di uh, you know, uh, underprivileged uh, population. We have a 50% EL population. And we also have a very high percentage of special needs students. So we, because of Stanford, we also have a transient population in our school where faculty children, uh, student children come in. And so this has been a great community hub for everyone, you know, for kids to make friends, for do, doing things. And so it's been a wonderful journey, you know, growing that. Um, personally, so uh, just a little background, our Baker Space is everything, not just 3D printers and coding, but we've got all kinds of hands-on crafts. And I loved what the previous panel said. We have lots of circuits of different kinds, not just the fancy Little Bits Pro library, but also just general snap circuits and just wires and uh, LEDs, so uh, all kinds of things. Um, as a maker, I don't know when I first identified myself. I worked in a previous industry and then decided to teach elementary school children. And when I came, I had no idea I would be teaching computer science or doing anything maker related. I just thought, I'm coming to teach an elementary school classroom. And one thing led to another. And the next thing I knew, I was doing scratch in my classroom with the fifth graders. And then I was out of the classroom doing all this with. I think that's sort of, I guess, when I just you know figured when I first, I think when I first started using scratch with my students, it's like, oh yeah, this is like, you know, we were all making and it was so exciting at what they can create. I think that's when I probably identified myself as that. My name is Casey Shea and I live and work in Sonoma County up here, uh, about an hour and a half north, depending upon how many other cars are on the road. Beautiful place, you should come <laughs> up uh, whenever you get the chance. Um, I was lucky enough to be teaching math at a high school about a 20 minute walk from the headquarters of Maker Media in 2011 when Dale approached our school, Dale Doherty, the publisher of the magazine, the founder of the Maker Fair, saying that he wanted to try and get a class in, in the high school and, and you know, to, to practice what he preached in terms of this kind of excitement and engagement that he saw at Maker Fairs you know, for about six years at that point um, into the curriculum. So we walked up with uh, ninth, or sorry, 10th through 12th graders twice a day up to the Maker Media campus and I was immediately sold that there was something here that had to find its way back onto campus. We went through a crazy year where he was doing a pilot for a pilot that turned into a DARPA grant that was supposed to go to a thousand schools in three years. <coughs> Fell apart for a bunch of reasons we could talk about afterwards, but met a whole bunch of great people from the Bay Area and around the country and, and really became more and more convinced that not only for students, students were the easier people to, to get in, but for teachers, right? Um, I saw teachers being able to reignite a passion after 15 or 20 years in the, in the business, uh, which is a rare thing for those of you who know about teaching, right? There's, it, it's, it's, well, I'll just, I'll leave it at that. Um, we went back down to the campus, we're able to expand the class, uh, the program to three classes, and again, bringing in teachers from all grade levels um, to, to get that excitement of, of the same excitement that the students get. If I can think it, I can have it in my hands in a matter of moments with the tools and technologies that are available. And, and for a teacher, you know, there's this one thing that's going to get whatever that topic is. And maybe you can find it in a book at a crazy price, a catalog, but if I can make it, that's exactly what I want, um, then that's going to empower me to keep thinking about how I can, you know, make things easier for my students. Um, again, the students are the easier, easier sells for these kind of things, right? Well, hopefully we'll talk about that a little bit more. But um, uh, went from there to working part-time at the County Office of Education in a more formal role trying to work with teachers. For the last two years I was doing both uh, part-time and two full-time jobs trying to do on a part-time basis was too much. There was lucky, luckily there was somebody at the high school who was willing and able to take over the program. So this year is the first year I've been working full-time at the County Office and um, we have, maybe we could talk more about the facilities there if that's appropriate, but people come in, we go out, we take the show on the road whenever we can. Um, and really the goal is, and I think the, the, real, the real key to making this a movement is supporting teachers and giving teachers tools to which they can use to insert this kind of stuff into their busy schedules and, and into a job that's already over full time. I was probably, the, the, the time transitioning to when I, when I realized I was a maker, I was lucky enough to have a grandfather who was sort of the Mr. Fix-It all over in our area. We lived in a 
far, it, right on the border of Napa and Sonoma County, where there's not a whole lot of hardware stores close, right, out in the middle of nowhere. He would build houses and fix things for people, you know, 20 miles in, in any direction. And oftentimes you would have to make do with parts that weren't necessarily designed for whatever the task at hand was, because otherwise it would have been an hour drive to get somewhere else. So getting that idea that you can fix things with what's around, um, getting to use tools, welding, you know, uh, I, I made my first bicycle a chopper when I was like five years old. So big old handlebars and a big chopper. And I remember seeing casters as I was thinking of it for a bed frame that had what looked like the forks of, a, of the chopper that I wanted to make. And I could see exactly how I wanted that to make it, but I, I didn't have the tools or the, the capability to do things with my hands. I, it just popped into my head again the other day when I saw a kid take an idea put it in Tinkercad, have it out in a 3D printer and, and you know, whatever, two or three hours it took the printer to, to make. But that, if I had that when I was a kid, it would have been, it would have been crazy, right? So, so I thank my grandfather for, um, for helping me learn tools and I'm, I'm super excited that kids have much more, sort of a faster route to that hand, uh, mind to hand workflow now. Thank you, yeah, at um, Design Tech, we're focused on um, teaching students design thinking, but what, what you all expressed right there about how you were able to have these experiences that kind of built your, helped shape your identity, I think that's why making is really important. It, I mean, we, just, we always say, what if schools were just organized around making sure everybody had a transformative experience? And that was the metric that we were really cared about, is really transforming the student and making, I think, gives students a great opportunity. And, and as you all expressed yourself, like you can have these moments where you can it really shapes who you are. Like they always say, when you create something, the thing you change the most is yourself. It's not, it's not about the final product. So uh, I noticed we had a lot of uh, people in the audience from K-12 space and also um, some nonprofits. So I'm curious, what have you found to be some of the successful factors in, um, or the factors that have led to the greatest success for you in your, each of your respective areas? success. So I guess um, I'll think a little bit about our fab lab. Um, I, th I think some of the factors which are probably not new to anyone in this room, but one is the people. <laughs> um, I mean, you've just got to have the right um, people, adults in the space that carry the passion and the values um, of the space that you're trying to create. And that just goes such a long way to having successful programming, if they have the mindset of this is a child-directed, curiosity-driven, open-ended kind of experience, um, to me that's one, one big factor. I think the other factor that we found, especially using uh, digital tools, uh, digital fabrication tools, is time, um, which I'm sure is, you know, we always want more time, right? <laughs> but, um, but especially with young children, uh, you know, when we have a drop-in space at a museum, uh, it's, you know, we think of that more at an exposure level to a lot of the tools and materials. When we have more time, when the kids are there for an entire week of camp or with our mobile program, program we go out for three days at a time. Um, we see the same class for three days in a row. When we have more time, then I think we can really build some deeper learning and thinking about spatial reasoning and transforming 2D to 3D and things like that. Um, so I think, you know, time is another factor that I would throw out there. So how do you find the right people? What do you look for? Oh, that's a great question. Um, you know, it's going to be a little different for every space. So for, I mean, ours specifically, we needed someone really versed in the technology. I mean, they should have a passion for laser cutting and 3D printing and things like that and some uh, versatility in that. But I think it's just the lifelong learner aspect. I mean, you're looking for someone who wants to continually learn and grow who's not afraid to make mistakes, who has enough kind of self-confidence and self-assurance that they're not gonna get rattled by uncertainty as we talked about a little bit, in the, that was talked about a little bit in the last panel, right? Um, you need someone that's gonna be really a flexible thinker, but also is a doer, right? <laughs> is going to execute um, and make things happen. So I would say three factors uh, that I would uh, state at this point. One is a very open and welcoming space. So everyone should feel like they can come in, they can do you know, what they'd like to that gives them satisfaction. Whoever runs the space or manages the space 
is responsible or a set of people, they need to make sure that everyone feels like it's theirs. It should feel like the students, for the students especially, it shouldn't feel like I can't touch this or I can't do that because that would, you know, uh, it would not serve the purpose we want. Uh, the second thing I would say is involving the broader community. So at our site, we not only have the school PTA and the students involved, but also people who live in the neighborhood, people who live in the city, who really, some of them have nothing to do with schools, but they, out of their goodness of their heart, they love to see what the kids are doing. And they just come donate things. They donate materials, they donate their time, they just come ask questions. It's, uh, and again, making it open and welcoming so that the community at large can feel like, oh yeah, we can come. I basically call it a cafeteria without the physical caffeine because people just come hang out. It's really fun. And um, it, it's very therapeutic. And the third thing I would say is the balance between the tech, non-tech, low-tech, high-tech. Like, it should be something that appeals to every single individual who walks into that space. It shouldn't be, oh, this is too hard for me. Yes, some things have to be hard, but not so much that they get frustrated. And um, it should appeal. So we talk about multiple intelligences a lot in the classrooms. But actually having the space to put that in practice so the students can see where they are successful, what is it they're passionate about, giving them the exposure to different things, that I think is, also, is very, very important. And whatever Lisa said is, you know, totally <laughs> on board with, with that. Yes. Um, <clears throat> for me and my, my role, success is measured by how many people, how many other schools are picking up these kind of things and going in this direction. And the way that we've been able to get a, a fairly large penetration in Sonoma County is to sort of throw out some introductory activities and, and introduction to making sort of workshops and look for those people who really get it. And then really support those people who are the ones who are gonna be the movers. Right? We're, we're working on a week-long workshop and, and sort of going around a Ben Franklin quote that there's a, three classes of people, those are immovable, movable, and then the movers. Right, the people who are gonna actually move that second class. And so we're really finding, I, I can see now after doing this for a number of years, that, gl that gleam in somebody's eye that really understands the implications and how it would work exactly for their situation. And then we can probably get something that's, that's pretty close to what they're thinking about, or at least down that road in a, in a short amount of time. Then they can translate that excitement to whoever their support people are. Our, our educational system in Sonoma County is completely fractured. There's 40 districts for a pretty small um, uh, geographical or, or population center. And that, um, I think that's worked to our advantage in that we haven't had a big centralized system that people have had to navigate. They've gotten to go through local support groups to get maker spaces in, in, you know, in K-6 elementary schools, um, a, a number of, of instances throughout the county. But really it has been getting those people who get it to be the champions on the ground and, and working a, a teacher to teacher network or teacher to librarian network, really on the grassroots level. Um, that has you know, percolated up, so now we get some administration support. And um, you know, it's successful enough in that I can't really help all the people that I wanna help with the time that I've got. So you know, trying to figure out how to manage that. But even on a bigger level, um, Paul's here from the CD Foundation. We've done the makerspace activities at the STEM Symposium for the last couple of years. Um, they've been popular places for people to hang out and experiment with some of this kind of stuff. Maybe that has something to do with it being a STEAM Symposium coming up in December in the same building um, where people are, 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 are looking for alternate ways to do their work, to show what they know. Um, we're hoping this year <coughs> to have a hundred some student groups doing that champion that message where they're going to have some alternative ways to show for instance like a science fair project the trifold science fair you know display has been around for 40 or 50 years maybe it's run its course with some of this other cool stuff Trey's micro bit right there I'd love to see on a, on a um, science fair uh, steam showcase sort of exhibit right there's all kinds of things out there so we want to get some some of those kids that know things to become the champions so the theme, a reoccurring theme I heard a lot, it's the people. It's all about the people. 
So how do you um, build the capacity of those people? Like, so what are some of the professional development opportunities if maybe there's interest, but there's not the skills? What are some of the things that you've done that you found very high leverage in building the capacity to get the people in place? And, and we don't have to just go straight down the line if somebody else wants to. <laughs> well, it's, I mean, it's sort of my main job, so I can tell you what we've done at the county level. We've got a, a design lab at the County Office of Education where we've got, it's a small space. Um, when I used to bring people into my high school space, it was a 3,000 square foot shop that we had repurposed, right? It had a lot of metal working stuff and electronics in it from a previous um, incarnation. There, it was great, I love it, um, but it sort of had that message that you have to have this kind of a shop to do this kind of work. Um, and, and you don't, right? Not everybody's gonna have that luxury. So in the county office, it was essentially just a little alcove walkway place where some tables were stored, and, and the joke is that's, that's where the burrito bar was for our bigger events. So there were some people in the, in the office who, whose main question was, where are the burritos gonna go? We'll find a place for the burritos, right? Anyway, it's less than 900 square feet, not in a square configuration, but we've got um, the, the four main areas that we sort of break down things are hands-on steam activities that are low-tech, popsicle sticks and glue guns, coding and physical computing, so Raspberry Pi, Arduino, things that bridge that gap between digital and physical, digital manufacturing, laser cutters, 3D printers, vinyl cutters, and then um, um, documentation and digital media kind of stuff. So we've got a, one wall painted green that's a green screen. We've got digital manufacturing equipment, desktop versions spread all around. We bring teachers in to have little workshops there and open up the space so that they can make that um, thing that they want to make that they can see in their mind. Um, we also have a lending library now that we've got through some grants. So once they come and get a little introductory coursework on something, they can take a particular tool for three to four weeks back to their classroom and work with their students. Um, and then we open up, uh, I tried to do just open houses again to try and get those people in. But having that time, that's the, that's the huge piece, right? Is that we're asking teachers who weren't necessarily trained on this kind of stuff to put in the amount of time that they had to put in to get their, per, their preliminary credential. And so that's why it takes that champion, that person who really gets it, because they're gonna have to put in the time. You can't assign somebody to be this maker champion. They've gotta come forward. Um, but, but then providing that space and that time for when things break down, right? Vetting tools and software so that they don't have to make mistakes or they can make fewer mistakes in the process um, is huge. So I'm, I'm lucky and proud of our county office for doing that. Um, I should throw in too that I'm part of the maker certificate program that's at Sonoma State. Um, started about three years ago and 400 people from around the country, mostly California, have gone through it. We're looking to expand that and got some funding recently to go to at least five different pilot um, county offices throughout the state. So it's the main um, thing that comes out of that is again a network of teachers that are in a regional hub that getting together Bay Area maker educators groups, there's splinter ones all over the, the regions of the Bay Area. But having that, carving out that time where teachers can talk to teachers and, and make the road, you know, to, to make her done a little less steep, it, it's best served when teachers are involved talking to teachers. So I would agree with Casey, the teachers talking to teachers has been the most successful. We do a lot of open houses. Um, so we call it playtime. Uh, sometimes the teachers don't even get credit for the time they come in. They're actually learning, but they come in because they really, really are inspired and want to do this for their students. So lots of open houses where everything is accessible to the teachers, where they can, you know, tinker around and do things. And then very focused PDs, not just in the space, but also at different uh, professional development opportunities, because just like Casey said, they shouldn't feel like, oh, if I don't have the space, I can't do it. Um, so, and then volunteering time to just give, you know, when anyone comes up with questions, with anything, just reach down to their level or reach up to their level or whatever it is to say, okay, these are the things you need to make this happen. And then focused areas, what I mean is like we'll do one workshop that's just 3D printing, one that's just on movie making, and it'll be separate for like a green screen versus a stop motion, uh, you know, sessions just for computer science, then it'll be coding just for primary grades, just for upper elementary, and then just for like middle and high school teachers. So various speedy sessions that are focused on various aspects of the Maker Studio. Our um, 
last open house of the year, by the way, is on Tuesday. So those of you who are in the area and want to pop in, Tuesday, 4 to 6, um, you know, where um, the kids are reorganized. I get messages from parents saying, oh, kids are reorganizing like the after school activities so that they can come. Can they bring a brother? Can they bring a sister? Can they bring a community friend? So, uh, and teachers come in for these all the time just so they can then get this done for their uh, classrooms. I also have to say that from an administrative level, we have not got an endorsement. And so, like Casey said, it has only worked teacher to teacher. So from one school, we have now expanded to almost all the elementary schools and a couple of the middle schools just by word of mouth through the teachers. Because, uh, I mean, of course, they're integrating it with curriculum. They're integrating it so the kids are learning the standards required. So it's not, I mean, it is playtime, but it's playtime in a structured way that isn't, uh, that doesn't feel to administration like, oh, this is a waste of time or money. So when you asked that question, I think I had to pause a minute too because I was thinking about building capacity at many different levels. <laughs> we have the capacity of our staff. We have capacity of the parents that and caregivers that come into our space, the teachers that we're reaching, the librarians that we're serving. So it's it's a lot of different um, adult audiences, and we don't have as much of a formal program like you know Casey might have been explaining. But I think the theme that runs throughout all of those audiences is scaffolding, and thinking about meeting people where they're at <laughs> and helping to push them a little bit further, right? Um, and not expecting that. If you're here, you're going to jump to here in, in one day. And so for our staff, I mean, they're they're coming in with a certain level. And we, you know, I keep poking the bear, right? <laughs> you try this. Hey, go to Maker Fair. Do this thing. Look at this video, right? Um, to kind of get them to m move their thinking a little bit further. For parents that come into our space, I mean, you can imagine sometimes parents are intimidated walking into our fab lab with a lot of expensive machinery, right? And tools and things around, and their three-year-old is there. And so we have a lot of messaging to parents. Um, we have flyers that go home with parents. We have research backing that shows why we're doing what we're doing. We have questions that the parents can ask their children while they're in their space, just so they feel more comfortable with the risks that we're taking there. When we're out in the community, same sort of thing, actually, we, uh, with our Triad truck, we ask parents to be volunteers with the programming, and um, we have stations where um, kids are learning to use a hammer or use a screwdriver and take something apart, and um, it's, we purposely put parents at those stations that maybe aren't as comfortable to <laughs> model for them um, what we can do. And they, they leave and they give us reports that are like, I was so empowered by using this hammer today. <laughs> I'm going to try this at home with my child. And so, um, you know, I think in kind of just recognizing where people are, what uh, fears or, um, you know, thinking they're bringing to the table, and then just helping them to move a little inch, right? And the next time we see them, we're going to help them move another little inch <laughs> along the pathway. Yeah, that's great. If I'd, it's funny, I'd always heard of, um, for us, we always say the laser cutter is the, um, the gateway drug to making. <laughs> like once the kids try a laser cutter, then, but it can also be the hammer. <laughs> that's great. Yeah. It can be, they can be that low tech. So, uh, you, uh, Samita, you mentioned uh, creating an inclusive environment, a welcome environment. Um, one of the things that we've struggled with at DTech is just making sure that we have um, a diverse group of students have access to, to making and also that are, that are choosing to, to do the activities. Have any of you um, had to take or what are some things maybe you've done to ensure that it really is a diverse group of students and it's not just the kids that are like, okay, I like robotics, so I'm living in the maker space. What have you done to ensure that there's um, diversity represented in your, each of your domains? So, uh, like I mentioned earlier, the, um, you know, having the balance and the range from low tech to high tech, so things that appeal to every child. Um, so, for instance, having hands-on crafts, having circuitry, having movie making, all kinds of activities so that it doesn't, the student says, oh, I don't want to sit in front of the screen and code, but I like that robot, or I want to put together these circuits, or I want to break apart a computer, which is very popular even for first graders, because then they learn about different things, and then they'll take those sound boxes and put batteries and wires onto them and make that work with something else. So all kinds of things that 
will appeal to every kind of learner. Now, the way the space is run is lunchtime is open to all. So anybody can come in. And then when the class comes in, then every student has access to the space. So basically, every student at the school gets to use the space. And uh, lunch is because, again, every student can have access. If we do after school, they cannot have the access. One of the things that I used to do when I was teaching the class full time, and, and I, it trailed off a little bit part time because I would do my class schedule and then have to run off and do something else, was do lunchtime sort of demonstrations and you know interactive things where I invite people in. Um, I could talk to, to girls in particular in my math class about some cool things that they could make and do a little promotion. The last year, um, well, last year was my last year teaching, so the year before that I wasn't able to do as much promotion um, and it, it definitely um, had, had its impact. We, got, we filled up all the three classes with essentially the 90% of the nerdy boys who were doing great, but, but it's so much more exciting when there's a mix of people in the room and you know, when things are really rolling, I can see the crazy robot stuff going with the crazy art installations happening all at the same time in different parts of the room. So I found that, that really hitting art classes, art students, and um, I got sort of smacked a little bit by some of my girl math students when I, when I asked, what kind of projects can I put out to attract girls? And she was like, Mr. Shea, girls like rockets and robots. <laughs> yes, they do. So what I learned is trying to um, recruit girls in groups. So it's not just one group, or one girl, but you know, three or four girls so that they can feel like they have their, their team when they're together. Yes, their social group together. So that, when we were able to do it, and I really I, 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 um, had a long conversation with a person who took over my class, and he did a much better job at that last year for this year, and when I walk in and visit, I can see now these little groups of girls who don't always work together, but knowing that they have that social group made it easier for them to take that plunge to go in. So that's a big, a big learning um, aha moment for me. Just a couple of really practical things that we do at the museum are, um, I mean, obviously at the museum there's admission to pay, but we have a sliding scale policy, so um, you can come up to our museum any day and um, say I can only pay a dollar to get in and we'll let you in. Um, so we don't want money to be a barrier to coming to our space. Transportation is definitely a barrier to coming to our space. We are located in a national park um, and it's very, uh, it's not public transit accessible. And so we um, have a policy for all of our school, school programs that at least half of them have to be scholarship based and we work really hard to find um, funding for busing so that we can um, pay for that so that schools can bring their students to our space. And that was um, a big impetus behind building our mobile lab so that you don't even have to come to us, we're gonna come to you. Um, and that same kind of policy stands that we really wanna be out there in communities. Our whole pilot was focused on Title I schools uh, and reaching them. And, and just even things like making sure you know, we have a lot of parents that are there with coming to the field trips and um, with the truck and making sure that we have things translated in multiple languages, that we have staff that can speak those languages, that can communicate with the parents and adults there that English might not be their native language. So you mentioned um, the administration is not on board, fully endorsed everything in your district. And I'm, one thing that we always face is the people who say, well, this whole making, design thinking thing, it's just a fad. Like five years from now, those maker spacers are gonna be something else. And it's just gonna, just like everything else. So what do you say to the people who say, well, this is just a fad, like I don't really wanna invest in this, it's gonna go away in a few years. It's just the, the hot, trendy thing of the moment. Well, um, in my case, I would say, uh, fortunately, no one said that to me because... <laughs> <laughs> because you work in Palo Alto. Uh, well, <laughs> exactly. Well, also because uh, I always invite them when the students are in the space. Once they see the students in action, there is no going back. They are sold like within the first two minutes. Um, but if I had to, I guess I would uh, ask them a question about things that they remembered from their school life and why they remembered X and not Y, and whether we are adults or children, 
we remember better with things that we've actually physically made or you know there's something tangible versus a memory associated to it versus something that we memorized or something that was just told to us like you just have to do it because you have to for this test and then it's done you get your a and it's gone so that's the argument i would use i don't know how well that would work <laughs> but uh, but yeah i would show proof of student work and student projects and um you know what the students have accomplished especially those who are struggling students and where they have found success i have been asked this so <laughs> i um I think about it as prioritization, not necessarily as a fad or not. So, you know, I believe we're born wanting to create and make and build things with our hands. Um, and from our ancestry, right? I mean, people built the pyramids, they built wheels, and we learned how to make fire. Like, it's, it's just in our DNA to want to be makers and creators. I think education goes through cycles. Um, and where that making is not always prioritized as the number one thing that we want to have children to take away. And so, you know, as you all know, we went through a period of education where we're focusing on, we want to build factory workers. So how are we going to build factory workers, right? So we're going to set up our education system in a certain way. So I don't think that idea of making and building ever went away. It just wasn't a priority for a while. I think it's a priority now, and I hope it continues to stay a priority. Um, the world is constantly shifting and changing. Will it maybe not be a priority in the future? I don't know, but I'm hoping that we all see the value of why it is a priority now and why we should keep it a priority. When I have conversations with people like that, when, and we talk about what it is that you want students to come out of school with, you know, creative problem solving is always something that people hold up as, as a, a goal, right? A valuable thing that, that we should leave school with. I, I can't think of a better way to get at that that sort of experience or practice in those kind of realms than in making something, than trying to, to take your idea and, and turn it into something in your hands, right? There's all kinds of things, problems that you have to solve, and the constraints that are in a school day and budgets force creativity to, to come into the mix. So um, that and talking to people who are going to hire these guys and, and realizing that probably most of the jobs that they're going to be interviewing for don't exist right now. So they have to be flexible, problem solvers, creative um, thinkers, and, and use, you know, well, those two things. I could say them in different words, but those exactly, you know, those, those skills are hugely important. We've had students come back and do some um, video interviews after they've done internships. One, one at, in particular was at Medtronic. And she said the thing that blew her away most was that, um, that she had, a, they were, she was given a goal of this project with no scaffolding at all how to get there, right? This is what you need to do, go do it. Um, and s in school, she was the AP track kid, right, who, who was able to follow along with all the steps that we la laid out for her, did all of the labs perfectly to get the result that the teacher knew was in there and all of the pieces that were in there, but did that prepare her for this real experience that she had? You know, not really. Um, so trying to show teachers, and, and this is a huge one, as a former math teacher, Content matters, details matter, right? Um, but the way that we've been doing it doesn't work for the kids who, the, if, if we were a business, we'd be out of business because they're not really buying what we're selling, right? And, and nor should they. It's, it's outdated in, in many respects. Um, to ask people just to change overnight to a complete project-based learning sort of system is probably not gonna work. But being able to, my, my task and the reason that I left the program that I loved was to try and help people sort of get you know, get a foot in the door or get some of these things in, in ways that can be introduced without totally rocking the boat because it's mostly teachers doing it. And, and our administration was behind us, about 10 feet behind us saying, yeah, you go, you're, you're doing a good job. <laughs> but, you know, not really paving the way for us, right? So, and I found that a lot. <laughs> yeah, we always say they're so far behind. <laughs> exactly. They're gonna think, people think they went for help. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> but, um, so Aaron, Aaron Vanderwerf, who's a local legend from the Lighthouse uh, Community Charter School, um, had, did a little talk that I was at, and, and he talked about when it's important. What do you get out of these activities? If you can't do them all the time, if you're not in a school that's a total project-based learning school, it does take a little bit of extra time to let the students sort of fumble through some things, right? Do student-centered work. But there's a couple of things, and one is just that bigger, are, are you designing so that students have more engagement and more agency in the project? You can certainly get it through making. 
and the other is for, for more deeper understanding, right? So, so if you're gonna spend that extra time on something, hopefully it's something that through that making and through that immersive quality, there's a deeper understanding. So I've asked teachers, what's the hardest thing that you teach? You know, what's the hardest thing for students to get? Let's try this stuff in that, because you're already gonna give it some more time. You probably already haven't found the answer, otherwise it wouldn't be the first thing we mentioned when it's hard. So let's try and get this, give the students a little bit of latitude in this area. And how to design that open-ended but directed sort of curriculum. And uh, you know, that deserves a whole panel in and of itself. Right? We, we end up talking about tools and the details of the tools too much, where the tools are just that, tools. Right, we want them to be tools to gather, well, to, to promote those two things, deeper understanding, um, engagement. So, so once the tools are in there, how do we, how do we use those in our daily, daily life? Great, thank you. So now uh, we do have some time for, to take some questions from the audience. So uh, go ahead. I think, is there a mic that's going to be passed around? Just please um, say your name and your organization, please, and then your question. I'm Leah Haynes. I'm executive director of um, Two Bit Circus Foundation. So my question is about access because you know we work a lot in Title I, uh, K through high school, and I toured a private school recently that had a fab lab, and I just wanted to sit on the floor and cry because there is no way that by the time our kids in Title I schools graduate and those kids graduate that there's any bridge. So my question is like what. What's the price range? We, we do really low-tech, hands-on, make drills, glue guns, screwdrivers, all that sort of stuff um, that's really affordable for Title I schools. But what, where's the starting point for what we're talking about here? Um, so when I started my program, we had that 10 foot behind support by the administrators and we had some, um, some money from, from the magazine and some hand-me-down tools, but we didn't have anywhere near one of these MIT level Fab Lab sort of funding budgets, and we still don't. And, and um, I totally agree with you, most of the schools that we're working with um, are, are in the same situation, right? So we, I, we put together a little folder that I think we can keep adding stuff to. It's a bit.ly link, bit.ly slash, um, yeah, maybe we can write it down. I think it's, I think somebody's coming there. bit.ly slash capital C crossroads. Makerspace with no space in between. Capital C, capital M, crossroads, makerspace. And in that, I've got a, a list of tools that, digital manufacturing tools. Um, could you, yeah, could you say it one more time, please? Yeah, and I'll make sure it works. Make uh, cro it's actually spelled. How about, yeah, she just writes it, what, something up there, and he changes. <laughs> yeah, I'll make sure it's up there before I leave. Let's put it that way. Thank you. Uh, and on that list, I, I've put a bunch of stuff, project guides that can be done with glue guns and and um, plastic water bottles. The Community Science Workshop Network. If you don't know their resources, got to look them up. They're amazing. But then there's tools that there are four main digital manufacturing tools that that we use: a laser cutter, vinyl cutter, um, 3D printers, and CNC machines. And there are perfectly functional, perfectly reliable machines for cheap. So for all four of those machines and materials to get them going and the software is less than, you can do it for less than $10,000. It's a lot of money, but if you look at, at a laser cutter that's typical in one of these fab labs, it's about a third of the cost of probably the laser cutter that's in there. So it can be done, especially on a younger grade level with tools that are you know coming way down in price. By the time you get up to a high school level, then it makes sense to have more professional machines that can get beat around a little bit more. But it's amazing um, what, what, where it's gone in terms of, of bringing the price down in terms of both hardware and software. And that list will be on that ambiguous link over there that I'll make sure is clear before we leave. So I would say for us it was way cheaper than that. Uh, but also because we had a 3D printer already through a grant, we still don't have a laser cutter because Glowforge has been on pre-order for the last two years. Uh, yes. And those of you who've paid money for, to Glowforge know what I'm talking about. Um, all of our money was just a few hundred dollars from Raft. The, those of you who are local know about Raft, which is the resource for teachers, where you get b buckets and buckets of, like, say, bottle caps and old CDs and all kinds of things. Everything else was donations. 
Fabric, I have not bought any fabric in three years. Um, what else? Cardboard, people just keep coming and giving boxes. I don't know where they show, like even like the neighborhood, you know. Um, glue and glue guns, yes, a lot and lot and lot of that. Uh, then once in a while, I'll buy shiny stuff, like, you know, those gems and uh, then also duct tape because it's expensive, so it comes in phases. It doesn't come through the year. So yes, it can be, there's, it's you decide where you want to start. You have a box of Legos coming in from somewhere, it doesn't even have to be bought new. Snap circuits, parents just donated them from everywhere. And we created these bins. We found out that our science resource center had all these green snap circuits just lying around with nobody touching them. She's like, your kids are gonna use it, just take it. So just ask around and you'll get stuff, but I think it doesn't have to be a dollar amount to get started. But I think those kinds of things are random laying around the house in Palo Alto, but not in South Central LA. Uh, yeah, I think it's more, I think just reaching out to the broader community. Not necessarily within there, but yeah. And something like a raft might exist. We are that in, in LA. You are that in yeah. LA, yeah. And I would, I would also encourage you to like, really focus on, on the outcomes of what, what you really want to happen. Because I mean, I've been in some of those same fab labs and they look amazing. And um, hopefully, like honestly, like I think we're going to have one pretty soon, hopefully, <laughs> once we move on to the campus at Oracle. But we made, when we started, like, we made some mistakes. Like we thought, okay, it's a makerspace. We need 3D printers. So we bought a couple of 3D printers and we realized this is not like a hands-on, like kids are downloading things, hitting print and making it. We're like, this is not making, this is not like giving us any kind of the, the outcomes. So I think you can get the important outcomes for the kids with like less expensive, cheaper things. And then we also lease a lot of equipment. I just want to add one quick thing. Even though we have a fab lab, I do not think that all children need to learn how to use a laser cutter. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, even in our space, it's always a choice, right? What's that? Oh, hello, hello, test. Um, so there's always a choice, first of all, that you can use that technology or not. There's always a low tech option. Um, and I agree, you can do amazing things with cardboard and tape and duct tape, and it doesn't have to be the tool. I mean, part of our mission in taking this out in a mobile space too is that I know there are schools that have those and we want at least children in other schools who wouldn't have it to be exposed to it and to at least have a day with it and get to see it and know what it is and know that that's a possibility of something that they could learn to use later. Can I add one more quick thing? One of our most successful elementary programs started with a principal who was actually the champion in this case, giving each of the kids a Ziploc bag on a Friday and said, come back on Monday with something that's gonna be part of our materials for our, our lab. So toilet paper tubes, paper towel tubes, you know, cardboard, old toys that people could use. Um, uh, everybody, you know, within reason, I mean, 99% of the people uh, participated. And, and I've seen this time and time again, that when you first start out with this, it's a problem of stuff. About a couple years in, it's still a problem of stuff. It's just a different problem, right? It's like once you become known as the acceptor of stuff, then stuff shows up on your doorstep. So what am I going to do with all this stuff is your, is your really quick problem that comes after that. Where am I going to get stuff? So have some plans in mind for limiting the amount of paper towel tubes that you need and when to yes. say no and how to communicate that. I, I'm just going to add one thing to this. There's an organization called FABMO. M -O, oh, that's based in, on the peninsula here. Uh, they, their specific goal is to get like furnishings, fabric, all these things to Title I schools and schools that need it. And I'm sure they would ship it out to you if you ask them to. So if you reach out for organizations like that, and both Lisa and I have also set up links in the same document that Casey set up. So you'll find access to lots of resources there. Great uh, question. And, yeah, so I mean, part of my question deals with all of you are from the Bay Area, and I and uh, what's that? Oh, my name is Alyssa Bushnell. I'm with Tools Camp out of Sonoma County, and we are all part of Silicon Valley. I'm a child born and bred in Silicon Valley, and I think what's happening in Silicon Valley in the maker spaces is completely different than what's happening anywhere else. And I was wondering, like, how do you how do you get your stuff and the other maker spaces that are here in this community? What are those challenges that you find? Because Silicon Valley, I think everyone's a maker, but I don't think that's the case outside of Silicon Valley. 
Well, I don't know if it's true, actually, that everyone is a maker here, even in the Bay Area. We still have a lot of, I mean, we talked to a lot of parents and things that don't know what Maker Fair is or don't know what being a maker is. So, um, but I do agree with you. I mean, I grew up in rural Pennsylvania, and there are definitely not the, um, you know, all of the resources that there are here available in the Bay Area. I'm, I, I'm curious, I'm, your question is more about how do we reach those other communities and make the spread. Um, I mean, I think sharing, one of the things I love about the maker community is the sharing aspect of it and um, and how we can do that even more. Um, we'll call out Trey from Maker Ed, which is where I used to work too, right? There are national organizations, Nation of Makers as well, right, that are trying to help connect people um, around the country. And I think we just need to stop reinventing the wheel. <laughs> and, you know, when people have um, learned something and, and not just share our successes, but share our mistakes and the things um, that, you know, you should avoid in this just to kind of save some heartache. It's going to be really unique to every community. And I think that's been one of the um, interesting challenges for all of us, right, in creating these spaces because everyone's got a different space and people and community are trying to reach and serve. But um, I think there is something in you know, bringing people together in places like this um, and virtually to to help just share our lessons learned and the mistakes we made and to um, keep that community engaged. There's pretty amazing stuff going on in um, rural places in California. I know in Tehama County, Michelle Carlson, you should look her up with work that she's done in um, juvenile justice, um, convinced a sheriff to let it's a it's a really restrictive environment for a lot of reasons in, in a juvenile justice system, but she was able to show some of the power of that. Um, places around the country like Pittsburgh, the Remake Learning Network that's going on right now, absolutely. Um, um, in Virginia, uh, Josh is in the room too from Digital Promise and the whole Maker Promise. He can probably talk about the number of people that signed up all over the country. Things are things are happening. It's just the people that are doing it are so busy doing it that we do really need a better system ecosystem of sharing. That, that crosses all those state lines and, and you know community boundaries. But I think that, that this stuff has a, a tremendous application in some of those places where manufacturing might, traditional large scale manufacturing might have gone away to be able to get little pockets of creativity. And, and for me, it, it would solve a lot of problems in a lot of areas that, that aren't the Bay Area, right? Where, where this could actually be a viable way for people to have little niche businesses that could, could be really meaningful for them. So I would just reiterate the sharing aspect. The sh sharing makes a huge, huge difference. So for all of us who are doing it, I think it's really, really important to share on all kinds of forums because that really helps those who are venturing out, who are trying things, who don't have the access, who don't realize what to do, because we get, you know, I'll get emails from someone somewhere in some part of the world because um, they're trying to do this, they're stuck, or they have a question, I think it's our duty to share it so that we can reach as many students everywhere. I also think maybe I'm not 100% sold on the word maker. Like it's in different communities, maybe we need a different word. Because I know I grew up on a farm in Idaho, and um, when I moved to the Bay Area, I went into a tech shop, and I saw like saws and welding, and like, this is, Maker, like that, this is work. <laughs> like, this is like, <laughs> why are people like renting like space here to do this stuff that I grew up like? This is the work we had to do, and so I didn't like think of it in the making. So I think in different communities, like don't I don't think you don't have to be completely attached to that word and like give people different entry points into it. I think we have time for one more question. So your name, organization. And uh, I'm question. Diane Levitt. I'm at Cornell Tech, the new Applied Sciences campus in New York City, and uh, my question is. Um, so we, we have clearly touched the power of uh, making in our work in K-12 in New York also. No worries, people are figuring this out all over the country. But um, I am really thinking a lot about that um, bridge from making to computing. And I just wondered how you make that intentional opportunity for students uh, to go from making, which is clearly an incredible gateway drug, uh, into uh, sort of computational making. Can I say, we, we had a, um, we've got a pretty robust middle school robotics program in the county. Maybe 800 kids show, show things. Basically Lego stuff. Drops off by the time they get to high school. 
So the next level of robotics, really the you know, showing robotics, the first robotics, is way too expensive for me to, to get behind. So we tried to figure out how can we do, I mean, it's beautiful stuff. If you're a first person, I love what you do, but it's, it doesn't reach in, enough kids for me to, to, to do it. So we did a Raspberry Pi coding contest that had to have some sort of a physical, manuf you know, physical <coughs> manifestation. And all, microcontrollers of all kinds of stri stripes are out there now that are really cheap. We, in fact, made a $500 limit on the amount of money that you could spend to design and build a prototype for something that was functional on your school campus. Nobody spent more than half of that. And they came up with things like really functional, practical things like call slip distribution systems that wouldn't require a TA. A, a counselor could type it in and it would be pushed out to the room where that student is on their, on their TV or something, right? So they actually made these things in a two-month period. Um, hall pass monitoring systems, things that you know were actual issues that they thought of for their school. So, so it's, again, easy and cheap enough to use these microcontrollers, Raspberry Pi, the micro bit. Um, Arduinos and all of the different flavors of those things to, to get that. And I think it's, I think it's, it's um, critical that we get them off the screen. It's easy to get them engaged in the screen, right? They're, they're, the, the things are glued to their hands. But to get that screen to control something physical, once that, uh, that aha moment happens, then the sky's the limit. I'll just add an example of, uh, we have an on-site preschool at the museum. And so these are four and five year olds and they were learning about housing and shelter. And you know, I think when we think about making the tr transition from making to computing, it's at a really basic level of just 2D to 3D, right? And a spatial reasoning. And so um, they made houses out of paper and different materials and then they broke up their house into shapes. What are all the shapes that make up that house? How many squares are there? How many triangles? How many circles? Now let's draw those out on a piece of paper. So we're taking our three-dimensional op op object, right, and we're making it two-dimensional. Now let's go down to the Fab Lab and let's work on the tablets. Let's use our fingers to draw triangles. Let's try working on our fine motor skills and use a, we use the pens, right, with the tablets and have them draw um, and play with scale of those shapes and things like that. And so now they're seeing their three-dimensional thing, right, two-dimensional and now digital. And now we're gonna send that message to the laser cutter and we're gonna cut out your pieces. And do they fit back together? Do they fit the way it was on the original house that you made. Why or why not? Is the size different? Is the shape different? Is the scale different, right? Um, so that's one of the ways kind of we've been experimenting with it and just sort of um, making that, because I think a lot of it is spatial reasoning, right? Especially when you're thinking about, um, you know, making something for the 3D printing and whatnot. And so we've been just really trying to break that down for young children and helping them to see three-dimensional objects and break them down into their two-dimensional pieces, right? Um, so that's just one example I wanted to throw out there. And I wanted to add one other thing um, when you said about using the word making, uh, because with a lot of teachers in K-5, as you know, I mean, NGSS is what a lot of them are concerned about. So we actually don't call it making, we call it engineering. Our triad truck is a mobile engineering lab. It's actually not a mobile makerspace. And so, I mean, that's, I say it's a makerspace here, but in the context that we are here, but we, we kind of publicize it as an, as an engineering lab. So it's, I just wanted to comment on that right, to your thank point. Thank you. So okay, I think- see, I'll just add one thing to this, which is we have a range of physical computing that goes in there, which is starting from simple B-bots to, you know, Lego we do where they have to make those <coughs> to different kinds of kits where, kits and not kits where they have to put together robots and so they do all of that. And for Raspberry Pi, their motivation is, you know, uh, to connect it. And once you connect it yourself, you can get to play on Minecraft, and then you get to program on it. So using different tricks to get them to that point, and I agree with Casey, getting them off the screen is actually harder. So we want to balance it out with different things that can help with computing without actually always being on the screen. All right, thank you. Um, please join me giving a nice round of applause to our panelists. Um, thank you for attending our session.